during the winter of 1989, I was a newly minted Marshall County Deputy Sheriff and I was just about as green as they come. I'd honestly expected rural policing to be something of an easy ride. I mean, all those fast-paced, gunshot, heavy cop shows were all set in Miami or New York or Los Angeles, not small-town Minnesota. But in reality, it was probably just as difficult. Just because they're stacked on top of each other down in Chicago, it doesn't mean they're any more or less evil than those who live on big old ranches out in the plains. And even though I didn't encounter street gangs or rioters or any curbside ladies of the night, I still have a few dark stories of my own. This is one of the darker ones, a story that we used to call the Grigla Snowman. It was late November when we got the call about a missing person over in Grigla, a small town of about 200 people out on Highway 89. I remember we drove out to a place called Evelyn Avenue, little more than a collection of small, single-story ranch houses that looked out over some open fields. Our missing person was a male in his late 40s. He had a young child, a stable background, no criminal record. By all counts, he was a happy person with everything to live for. But then one night, he goes out into the field out back, builds himself a snowman, and just walks off through the snow to God knows where. We asked his wife how she knew he'd built the snowman. She told us that, although she hadn't seen him building it with her own eyes, her young daughter had been pointing towards the snowman and exclaiming, Daddy, over and over again. She figured her daughter had caught sight of her father working on it, possibly in the process of being put to bed. If that was true, the only real clue we had was the set of footprints leading back from the snowman towards Evelyn Avenue. After that, the prints disappeared. They hadn't disappeared because the dad had gotten into a car either. The truck was still parked up in the driveway and had been since he'd gone missing. So wherever he'd gone, it had been on foot, in the middle of one of the worst winters on record. Once we realized it was going to be a bigger operation than we figured, we asked the state patrol to step in and thankfully, they proceeded to throw the kitchen sink at the entire investigation. We had people going over the missing guy's financials, we had people going door to door. The only thing we had to wait for was a dedicated search and rescue team that included sniffer dogs. Minnesota State Patrol had a chronically underfunded canine program at the time, so we were mostly reliant on the MSRDA, or the Minnesota Search and Rescue Dog Association, so much so that our investigation pretty much ground to a halt until we could get canine support. I'll never forget the day we all congregated at the end of Evelyn Avenue. There had to be a posse of at least 20 of us. Local deputies, state patrol, volunteers with sniffer dogs. We had a good idea that the father had walked out into the field, then had walked back towards Evelyn, but after that, we had no idea where he'd gone. So you can imagine our surprise when the dogs let us off into the field, then just refused to move anywhere else. They just kept circling the snowman, barking and indicating at it, I guess. Looking back, I honestly can't believe we didn't consider it from the get-go. We were so focused on the tracks leading back out of the field and all the stuff about the guy having everything to live for and that we didn't stop to, how should I put this, think of the unthinkable. So as we're all just standing around the snowman, waiting for the dogs to move off, there was this sort of penny drop moment, I guess. Well, one of us had the penny drop moment and it was one of the state patrol officers. All of a sudden, I just hear him talking to one of the volunteers like, Hey, hey, get away from the snowman! The guys near it jumped back all confused for a second, but as the state patrol officer knelt down by the snowman and began delicately clawing at the frozen white mass, the rest of us realized what he was doing. There was this distinct no effing way moment when the patrol officer's delicate digging suddenly revealed this black spot, and kneeling down next to him, we all saw what was clearly the black tread of a boot. Within the hour, we had forensics out there, setting up a perimeter around the snowman before they cleared the rest of the snow away. The missing guy's body was curled up in the fetal position, the cause of death being blunt force trauma to the skull. Then, 
Whoever had either knocked him out or killed him had just piled snow over his body. We never figured out if there was some greater significance to it or if the murderer had just taken the opportunity to hide the body in plain sight, but either way, the cover actually worked for around 40 plus hours. Obviously, the footprints leading away from the snowman belonged to the killer and not the victim. Something we really should have figured out earlier. But the thing that really sticks with me is how the guy's young daughter kept pointing at the snowman and saying, Daddy. Did she actually see her father being interred, I guess you could say, in that temporary frozen tomb? He'd been known to build snowmen with her in the years prior, so it's possible that the snowman simply reminded her of her father. But I can't help but think that in years to come, there might be some repressed memories just fighting to claw their way free of the mental fog of youth. We never caught that killer, and that accounts for one of the few regrets I have about my time as a deputy. I remember we made an arrest at one point. State Patrol brought a guy in for questioning because he had priors or something but the county sheriff never liked the guy for it and was no surprise when the case against him quickly fell apart. After that, little by little, they kept reducing the number of officers on the case until one day, once the sheriff was sure the media wouldn't kick up a stink about it, the whole thing was just tossed into some filing cabinet with the rest of the cold cases. No justice, no closure, no answers. Shortly after... The poor widow and their kid ended up moving out of town, probably to move in with relatives who could help raise their daughter. After that, people slowly stopped asking us about the case, and then after a while, it was as close to as forgotten about as possible. But it won't be truly forgotten until the guys that were there that day are all dead. You don't just forget about something like that. I know that kind of goes without saying, but even with all the messed up horrifying or heartbreaking things you see in law enforcement, it's incidents like the snowman that are the ones that really haunt you, and you spend way longer than you should trying to reconcile the creepy coal lump smile on its face with the horror of what we found at its base. Back when I was in fourth grade, we had this girl in our class called Sarah. Sarah was definitely a problem child and nowadays it was probably her parents that were to blame, but at the time, I hated her because she was just weird. Then one year, after winter break, Sarah wasn't in our class anymore. A bunch of rumors went around about what might have happened to her, but no one knew for sure, not until someone spotted her in the next larger town over. The next thing I hear, Sarah's parents had cut all her fingers off. I was only nine years old at the time, but even then, I thought that sounded a little far-fetched. My parents punished me for stuff too, but I got grounded or spanked or something like that. Same with all the other kids. Your mom and dad don't snip your fingers off no matter how bad you've been. We figured Sarah would be back at some point, so we'd get to ask her ourselves. I mean, she still needed to go to school, right? She wasn't dead. But when we asked our teachers, he said that Sarah wasn't coming back to class and had gone to live with relatives out of state. So then it was like, oh my god, is she dead? It was only years later that I found out the truth and how the creepy finger cutting thing was actually kind of half true. Sarah had lost her fingers, but they hadn't been cut off. She'd run away from home because of something her parents did. We never found out what they did exactly, but it was bad enough that she'd want to run into the woods in the middle of a snowstorm. So bad that no matter how cold she got, she refused to go back to her parents. Sarah got frostbite. She almost lost her nose and part of her cheeks, but doctors couldn't save six out of her ten fingers. She would have died if it wasn't for some stranger picking her up at the side of the road and rushing her to the emergency room. Then, as for the whole thing about going to live with relatives out of state, none of that was true. Sarah didn't have any family that CPS knew of, and her parents were such a risk to her that they placed her in a foster care in a whole other state. Definitely the most messed up memory I have of my childhood, and 
Sometimes I think about Sarah and I hope she grew up to be relatively happy in the care of people who actually cared about her. The scary side is wondering what her parents were doing to her that had make her so scared. Like I get that she might have just gotten lost, then tried to get back home and just couldn't, but that just doesn't sit right with me. Like I said, we were fourth graders, but we weren't dumb. It would be pretty hard to get lost in the woods because you can basically still see our town through them. They're not that dense. So what did Sarah's parents do that she'd rather almost die than go back and get help? But honestly, at the end of the day, I think I'm better off not knowing. A few weeks ago, myself and some childhood friends decided to meet up for the first time in literally years. We were all in our late 30s now, and we'd been drifting apart for a few years thanks to increasing work commitments, as well as an increasing number of children. We tried to stay caught up, but last year, the whole situation obviously ate up an opportunity that we'd had for a 2020 meetup. So, come the beginning of November this year, we were chomping at the bit to get out to the cabin for a few days. So, the cabin I'm referring to here is a little pet project of ours that dates back almost 10 years. We've always had quite an outdoor activity-based friendship, only less hunting and more like s'mores around the campfire kind of guys. So, we figured that instead of getting gouged to rent one, twice, or three times a year, we should probably just pull our money and buy one with ownership being split four ways. So we found one, bought it, and spent one whole summer fixing the thing up. And boy, was it a fixer-upper. I guess you get what you pay for because we didn't pay much. But getting to basically rebuild the thing ourselves generated this deep emotional attachment to it. So as you can imagine, not getting to see the place for just over a year really sucked. Naturally, we were hooping and hollering when we arrived on Friday the 5th, due to depart on Sunday the 7th. We had beers, burgers, and a lot of bourbon, and after more than a year of all the anxiety from 2020, it was great to get back up into the mountains again. At this point, it's almost like I want to be able to tell you about some creepy phenomena that began with our arrival and steadily increased in intensity. Something. Anything to have given us an idea that something was wrong up there but there was nothing. No howling in the night or footsteps outside the cabin. We didn't spot anyone watching us through the trees or find weird footprints in the snow. Nothing to warn us of what was to come. The first night was like all the other first nights at the cabin. We spent it out by the fire, roasting wiener dogs, toasting marshmallows, and getting very, very drunk. Then the next morning, once the bacon, egg, and cheese had blown away the hangovers, we decided to give the cabin a quick fix-up, while those less DIY skilled would go out to fetch firewood. Being fairly handy with a hammer and nail, I stayed around the cabin to replace some of the ceiling planks, and after another round of bacon, eggs, and cheeses, we got back to work and getting all the chores out of the way so we could get back to relaxing. I was hauling firewood while two of the other guys, Paul and Jason, were out looking for dryish dead wood that we could use for kindling. The snow had been coming down pretty heavy up here in Montana and almost everything was soggy and unusable, so gathering up firewood was probably the biggest task we were faced with. I had maybe three or four hunks of firewood in my arms, making what must have been my 20th run while walking towards the little drying area we'd set up when I just hear something that makes my blood run cold. It was one of my buddies, and they were screaming for help. I didn't think, I just reacted, dropping the logs and sprinting through the forest in the direction of the scream. I called out for Paul and Jason, honing in on the sound of their reply, and suddenly, there they were. Paul was lying face up on the ground, totally unconscious with what I first thought was a gunshot wound to his chest. Jason had both his hands over it, keeping pressure on the wound, and I was pulling out my phone before he even suggested I call 911. When the dispatcher told me we might be waiting for up to 30 minutes for an air paramedic, I felt sick. I figured with where the wound was located, right near his heart, 
paw would never last that long. But right after, the dispatcher basically tells us it's all down to us to stem the bleeding, so the victim would be alive when they arrived there. Talk about high pressure moments. I mean, the dispatcher phrased it in the nicest way possible, but that's basically what she said. Either we, his best friends, fight for his life to give him the best chance possible, or he was never going to survive in the first place. The dispatcher then asked how much blood was coming out of the wound, and there was this sort of ray of hope when we realized that, although there was some blood, the wound would have been gushing blood if it pierced Paul's heart or some other major blood vessel. That's when we realized he might actually be okay, and the relief was so palpable that we really didn't consider much else in that moment. For me personally, I was so stuck on the idea that he'd been shot that I didn't stop to think it could have been anything else. And I know what you're thinking. Mr. Gun Guy, if he had been shot, there'd be an exit wound, a bunch more blood, blah blah blah. But consider this, Mr. Gun Guy. Bullets can ricochet, they can also splinter, and considering some states enforce a hollow point only system, these bullet fragments could easily cause a smaller, less penetrative wound, right? But I'll get back to theories later. Paul woke up before the helicopter arrived and we were asking him, what happened? But he was in such a bad way that he didn't even know where he was. He was just looking up all hazy-eyed and asked, where am I? What's happening? We figured that was basically normal since he seemed to have been knocked unconscious during whatever attack had occurred. We didn't realize how hard this would make things later. Not long after, a park service vehicle showed up who in turn guided in the EMTs on the helicopter, and I swear, that's the closest I'll ever come to seeing angels descend on Earth. It was magnificent. They were the most professional people I'd ever come across, and I'll be grateful to them till the day I die. Paul was then taken to a hospital, so obviously our whole cabin trip was completely called off, and we spent the weekend in a motel on this small mountain town where the hospital was. It was more like a small clinic, but we didn't care if it was John Hopkins. They saved Paul's life. To us, the doctors and nurses, these were true heroes in my mind. But that was about the only good news we had for the rest of the weekend, as the remainder of that Saturday and Sunday were spent in pretty much a constant state of either anxiety or straight-up terror. So like I said, we were convinced the whole thing is some kind of hunting accident. But after a series of examinations, the doctors tell us that there was no bullet fragments in Paul's chest, and that his injury is more consistent with some kind of stab wound. Obviously, whoever had hurt him had done so face to face. We then asked Jason, the guy who was with him at the time, if he'd seen anything in the time before the attack. He said they lost sight of each other momentarily while out looking for firewood, then the next thing he knew, he heard the faint sound of Paul's body hitting the ground. That's literally all he heard. No gunshot, no sound of any struggle, no scream, nothing. He didn't think anything was wrong at first, so we just walked over to where we'd heard the sound, and he's greeted with the sight of Paul lying face up with blood on his jacket. Then right while we're all talking it out in the lobby of the clinic, trying to work out just what in God's name could have happened. The cops showed up. This didn't exactly make us nervous at first, and personally, I was happy to see them. I mean, the cops are supposed to help, right? They're the good guys. You don't expect them to just stroll up and accuse a person of trying to murder their best friend. And yeah, that's exactly what they did. After an initial round of casual questioning, the cops asked us if we were going to hang around town until Paul was discharged. Obviously, that was the plan. We weren't going to leave without him, but we got the impression that they didn't want us to leave town, and this hunch turned out to be correct. On the Sunday evening, the cops showed up at the clinic wanting to talk to Jason. We were out down at a bar at the time, but the clinic gave the deputies Jason's number, and they called to say that they wanted to talk to him. He said he was headed back to the clinic after dinner, but the cops insisted they wanted to talk down at the station, which immediately sent alarm bells ring for us. By his own admission, Jason had nothing to hide, and I remember he shrugged off the suggestion that he might need to get an attorney. But in the end, he got one, 
mostly because he had to. The whole we need to talk thing was basically an ambush and it turned out the cops had him down as the prime suspect. They didn't believe a word of his story that he hadn't heard or seen anything and they basically told them they were going to search his belongings until they found the weapon he'd used. And then this brings me to the weapon. The doctor said Paul had been stabbed by something long, sharp, and thin, most probably an ice pick. But not a single one of us had an ice pick in our possession, and as much as the cops scoured the area around the cabin to find one, they failed to do so. But regardless, the way the cops saw it, there had been a fight amongst friends. Jason attacked Paul in a moment of rage, but then instantly regretted it. I can understand why an outsider might come to a conclusion like that. I really can. But we knew Jason and Paul. I mean, really knew them. And there's no way they'd have gotten into a fight, or at least they'd have admitted it if they did. But Jason denied it, and Paul has apparently no memory of the attack. One solitary thing he told the cops was that before his memory went dark, he had the vague sense of not being alone. But then Jason was like 50 yards away, so why wouldn't he feel like that? In the end, they had nothing to charge Jason with, so they let him go. Paul was discharged on Wednesday the 10th, still in quite a lot of pain, but otherwise in no further danger. The cops actually asked him if he wanted to press charges against Jason, after which we got to see him go through all the stages of confusion and fear that we had while he was being treated. We're all back in Boise right now, but the cops have our numbers, and they might just get in touch again since it's an open investigation for attempted murder. But we literally have no idea what happened to Paul three weeks ago, and there's just one little aspect of the incident that honestly scares the life out of me. So, remember when I mentioned how the doctors told the cops that it appeared as if Jason had instantly put pressure on the wound. Well, there's another explanation for why the blood loss wasn't as large as it could have been, and that was the wound in Paul's chest was less than a millimeter in diameter. You start to see why they figured the weapon was an ice pick or something, because nothing else can account for how minuscule the wound was. But actually, seeing the wound for myself, there was no way something as large as an ice pick had caused it. In fact, when Paul got a second opinion after having the wound examined back in Boise, the doctor there said it was almost like it had been caused by an old-timey Pravis syringe, a kind from the 1850s that had a real thick needle. But who goes around looking to stab people in the middle of nowhere with a 170-year-old syringe? But again, the answer to that was a complete mystery, and is probably going to remain so for the foreseeable future. Then... There was the thing about the amount of blood on his jacket. A wound like Jason's would normally cause internal bleeding and, as his chest cavity filled with blood, it had put pressure on his lungs and make it difficult to breathe. So the fact that there was a sizable amount of blood on his jacket from such a small wound was just odd. And suggested that there had been some kind of pressure imbalance, almost like whatever had been plunged into Paul's chest was designed to suck blood out of his chest cavity. And then there's the location of the wound itself, almost directly over his heart. Look, I know what I'm about to ask sounds completely outlandish, and I still have no idea how to piece all these pieces together so that they make sense. But is it possible that someone stuck some oversized needle into Paul's chest with the intent of draining the blood from his heart? This all happened less than three weeks ago, so we're still searching for answers while the police continue their investigation. It's also looking a lot less likely that Jason is going to be charged with anything. The cops still seem convinced he had something to do with the attack, but pinning it on him is going to be near impossible without any solid evidence. I for one don't believe he did it. Jason doesn't have a violent bone in his body and aside from some inexplicable psychotic break and a vanishing ice pick, the only real explanation is one that scares me even more. I try and take some degree of comfort in the idea that we'll get to the bottom of this whole thing in the coming months, but the way it's looking right now, it doesn't look like that's going to be the case. I just know that if we ever really do get answers on what happened that afternoon, I just know they're going to be absolutely horrifying.
One of the scariest moments of my life occurred during the winter of 1994. I grew up in this old mining town out in Colorado. The kind of place was just one of everything. One grocery store, one church, one school. You get the idea. It's in a pretty remote area and it's one that's dotted with abandoned mine shafts of all different sizes. Obviously, it's not exactly safe for kids to go out playing on the outskirts of town and the way I saw it, The need to keep kids away from the old shafts gave birth to rumors of what we called the pig man. The pig man was said to be almost nine feet tall, with hooves for hands and a pig's head instead of humans. It lived out in the mines, was the product of some unholy union of man and beast, and lived mostly on a diet of cute woodland creatures. But when the pig man could get its hands on kid meat, it ate that. It sounds like a bunch of nonsense, right? All just made up to keep kids away from dangerous places. I think I probably believed it when I was smaller, but by the time I was 13, and I'd actually been to a few of the old mine shafts, I knew it was just a made-up story. But it wasn't a story, and I found that out quick. That was also the day that I found out how sometimes grown-ups tell kids stories for a reason. Not so much to baby us, but to protect us. So like I said, I was 13 and me and my friends used to spend a lot of time out on our bikes. Because the old mine shafts had an allure of danger about them, and we were in the hobbit of ghost hunting, they were too good to resist. We used to ride out to each one during the weekends of winter break, exploring as much as we dared before ticking it off our list of potential ghost hunts. And then came time to ride out the old McLennan Mine, one of the largest in the area and maybe even the largest in the entire state. We were adventurous, but we weren't dumb, and we knew not to go too deep into the mines or anywhere that was cold, dark, and dangerous. But as it turned out, we didn't need to. The thing in that mine came to us. Because as we're exploring the first hundred yards of the mine shaft, we start hearing something moving in the darkness ahead of us. It sounded like rocks crunching under the weight of something and since animals, sometimes bears, occasionally use the mine shafts as their dens for hibernation, we started to get a little nervous. We're shining our flashlights on a section of the tunnel that drops down out of sight, convinced we're about to come face to face with a black bear or something equally intimidating. We kept backing off towards the entrance to the mine shaft, but we were doing so painfully slowly, flashlights glued to our hand. We were scared, but this rabid curiosity seemed to be outweighing the fear of it all. We hear a little more scuffling down below than something that sounded like a grunt. But by that time, we're basically convinced it was an animal, so we're even more or less keen on seeing what it was. Then, right as we hear some more scuffling, there's another grunting sound, only that time, it was quite clear that what was going on down there wasn't exactly an animal. Or if it was, it was freaking huge. The fear ramps right back up again as we silently start moving back towards the entrance. Then as we're almost near the entrance, I hear what sounded like a word being spoken behind us. I freeze, turn around, and shine my flashlight in that direction just in time to see something come into view. And literally, the second I laid eyes on it, I just turned and screamed, run. And I screamed run because I saw the pig man. I saw his snout, his molted skin. I saw his bright red eyes and his hooves for hands. It was the single most terrifying moment of my life. And as we rode back into town, I swear we didn't stop for a second until we were back in our respective parents' homes. Naturally, I was in a real bad way by the time I got home, and although I'm not too proud of it, I remember bursting into tears as soon as all the adrenaline started to taper off. They were ugly tears too. I'm talking like wailing, not just sobbing. Mom and Dad rushed in my room almost right away, worried that I was hurt or something really terrible had happened to me. To me, what I saw was terrible. It was the scariest thing I'd ever seen in my life. Even today I get the shivers just thinking about the face I saw. But what messed me up was that I had literally no explanation for it. Well, 
outside of the terrifying tale of the pigman, of course. However, my parents, on the other hand, they did have an explanation for it. And since I was sort of old enough to handle the truth, they told me something that I found utterly depressing. So the pig man was real, not just a made-up story to scare kids. Well, it was supposed to scare kids and keep them safe. It was just based on something very, very real. The pig man had been a miner, like so many others who used to live and work in our town, and as it turned out, the old McLennan mine was shut down due to an accidental fire that caught in one of the tunnels. The company had managed to get most people out, but one or two guys just couldn't get out in time. Pigman was one of them. He'd been so badly burned that his nose was almost completely gone. In fact, he received life-changing burns to almost his entire body. Then, after that, the battle with various insurance companies as well as the mining company himself just drove him completely insane. He'd lost almost everyone close to him in that fire, and here was some pencil pusher like, I have a thousand questions and exams to put you through before you can get a cent from us. Then, once he was healthy enough, Pigman just walked out of town one day and didn't come back. People thought he'd gone for good, either moved on someplace else or like died or something. But no, Pigman just wanted to spend whatever time he had left in that place he'd lost so many of his friends and colleagues the McLennan mine. I get why parents might feel the need to lie to their kids about it, or rather, why they might tell them half-truths to scare them away from something that would haunt them if they came to understand it. But the thing that gets me is that the pig man, he's supposed to be the monster lurking out in the mines. But to the pig man, or whatever his real name is, it's us who are the monsters. People who saw a man who'd lost almost everything then treated him like a freak and an outcast when he couldn't just be normal again. I drive truck for a living, not long haul semis or anything, but I'm still on the road a lot. And up here in Massachusetts, it gets wicked bad during the winter sometimes. I remember passing a semi on a snow-covered two-lane highway one time. My truck started sliding and I was basically sideways between the snowbank and semi doing like 55 miles per hour. Somehow we both came out okay and it was all because the semi driver stayed cool as a cucumber. If he had braked or tried to turn, I might not be around to be riding this. But he just sailed on through, then slowed his truck down and got out to see if I was okay. Another time, I ended up hitting a patch of black ice on a poorly lit highway. I was doing 360s. The whole road was lined with trees on both sides. No ditch to slow me down, and I was just convinced that that was it for me. I didn't walk away from that one. I ended up upside down on the side of the road, and when I opened up my eyes, the Syracuse Fire Department was sawing off the door of my truck. It was like they just appeared out of nowhere the moment I crashed, and in reality, I'd been out for like 40 minutes with a concussion after getting knocked out by my airbag. I never go out when it's like that anymore. Even if my wife let me, it's just not worth the risk. My uncle died recently passed away in early January after a freak car crash. He hit a patch of ice, slid off the road, and hit a tree. It was tragic. Everyone was devastated. Deaths are all the harder when they come suddenly like that. But the more I think about the way he died, the more his death scares me. Like I said, my uncle slammed into a tree after hitting a patch of black ice. From what I heard... He was trying to keep his car on the road, and while he was swerving from side to side, he just careened into this tree at the side of the road. The only tree for literally miles around. Where we live is mostly just corn and wheat fields, flat as the eye can see, and I guess whoever carved up the land and ran the highway through it decided to just leave this one tree there. I don't know, for decoration or whatever. 
If he'd have crashed into one of the fields, he might have just been just fine. Sure, if he rolled his car, that's bad news, but just bouncing into a barren cornfield might only have resulted in cuts and bruises. My family and his friends put it down to bad luck. Just happened to skid at the wrong place at the wrong time, then boom, his life is over. But then, here's where things get weird. I thought I was going crazy for a while, like I was legit looking at online therapy sessions. There are a ton, go figure. I thought I might have just been obsessing over minor details as a way of compartmentalizing my grief, which was obviously manifesting in a really unhealthy way. But then I started looking stuff up online and 26 people have all crashed into that lone tree since the end of World War II and every single crash has been fatal. It always happens in the winter, but I thought that was going to be a given. But then every incident I found was between Christmas Day and January 3rd, which is exactly 10 days. And in each crash, there was only ever one person in the car. I thought this was kind of freaky, but then I figured there might have been other crashes that weren't reported and it was a well-known so-called accident black spot. But if that was the case, and the local highway patrol had known about this since the freaking 40s, just cut down the tree, right? How did whole different generations cart bodies away from that thing and still not think to cut it down? And how did 26 different cars smash into it without it coming down on its own? That's a lot of questions, right? But they were questions I wanted answered, and so I called the local sheriff suggested he get rid of that lonely old tree. Heck, I even offered to saw through that SOB myself. Bearing in mind this is the same sheriff who was uber supportive of our family after the crash, but he just changes his tone like, now why would you want to go and do a thing like that? I thought he was kidding me, so I brought up the 26 fatalities, told him we might be able to save a few lives, and managed to stop myself from barking at him about how uncle would still be alive if the tree wasn't there. He said he'd get back to me, only he didn't. It's been months now and I still can't get him on the phone. It's getting to the point where I think something strange is going on with that tree. I'm going to drive out there to check it out and maybe edit this post later or post a new one reporting what I find. I'm not some kook who believes in orbs or ESP or anything like that, but that's what gives me the creeps about this. I think this is something that science might not be able to explain, not at the present anyway. And I can promise you, when I do drive out there, it'll be smack bang in the middle of summer, on the warmest night of the year. Born on October 19th of 1965, Joyce Vincent was raised in the London suburb of Fulham. Her father, Lawrence, was an Afro-Caribbean carpenter while her mother, Lyris, was of South Asian heritage. Both had emigrated from Granada to London before she was born. Yet sadly, Joyce's mother died of surgical complications when she was just 11 years old. Following their mother's passing, Joyce's four older sisters took over the child-rearing duties and essentially becoming Joyce's surrogate mothers until she was able to look after herself. Lyris's death had caused the girl's father to become incredibly emotionally withdrawn, and this put such a strain on the family that what should have been a network of support became something Joyce desperately wanted to escape. Although she left school with no qualifications to speak of, Joyce's charm, charisma, and natural intelligence meant she was able to secure herself a relatively well-paying position as a secretary. Her social skills also proved a boon in less professional circles too, and by the time she was just 25, she was getting backstage passes to some of the hottest events in London, including the Nelson Mandela International Tribute for a free South Africa concert that took place at Wembley Stadium in 1990. The height of Joyce's own career would come in March of 1997, when she began working for an accountancy firm, Ernst & Young. However, after four years working a lucrative job in the Treasury Department, to all observers, Joyce's life was going fantastically well, and she had a bright future ahead of her. But unbeknownst to them, there was a darkness lurking beneath the surface. 
when Joyce abruptly resigned from her job in March of 2001, her colleagues were stunned. Instead of giving a two weeks notice, she simply cleared out her desk one day and disappeared. Management had lined up an exit interview to figure out if there was something about the work environment that Joyce had found upsetting or distasteful, but for all intents and purposes, she flat out refused to give a reason. Obviously, information on her life from that period is sparse, but there are two things we know for certain. Firstly, Joyce hadn't left her job at Ernst & Young for a better position elsewhere, rather for a cleaner's job in a budget hotel. She also moved into a different apartment at around the same time, one that was discovered to be a domestic abuse shelter. Friends said this decision confused them as Joyce didn't appear to be in a relationship at the time, and her career at Ernst & Young seemed to have been going well as it could be. But regardless, her relationship with her family and friends became more and more distant, to the point that she became little more than a ghost to them. One friend later said, she detached herself from her family, but there was no bust-up. They're a really nice family. We didn't know at the time, but we later found out that she was in a relationship and there was a history of domestic violence. She didn't talk about it, though. Not at all. It's like she was ashamed of it, or maybe she just didn't want her abuser to find her. By the winter of early 2003, Joyce was still living in the domestic abuse shelter above the Wood Green Shopping City in London. This apartment was owned by the Metropolitan Housing Trust and was routinely used to house victims of domestic abuse until they could get their lives back on track. Only, right as things seemed to be picking up for Joyce, she suffered through a sudden medical emergency in which she vomited up blood and was rushed to the hospital as a precaution. Doctors discovered she had a peptic ulcer, a frightening but entirely curable condition, and after two days' worth of treatment, she was released. Around the same time as her hospitalization, we know Joyce had been seeing someone of romantic interest. Some have insisted that this person was new in her life, but others maintain that it was merely a cover for returning to her abusive ex, something which is depressingly common among victims of abuse. But what is clear is that shortly after she was released from the hospital, Joyce seemed to drop off the map entirely. When friends stopped hearing from her, they assumed she just wanted some space, and whatever family she had left were apparently too busy to check on her. Weeks turned into months, months turned into years, and still no one had heard from Joyce. It reached the point where some who'd known her believed she moved out of town, maybe even eloped with her new squeeze. Joyce's neighbors were just as disinterested. They didn't question why the TV seemed to be constantly switched on in her apartment, even late at night, and they eventually assumed the bad smell seeping through the door was from the garbage cans at the bottom of the stairwell. It was only when someone's bottom line was affected that anyone bothered to check on Joyce. In the end, the first people to knock on her door in literally years were a team of debt collectors. On January 25th, 2006, and whilst in possession of a set of the apartment's keys, the debt collectors entered Joyce's home. One described the aroma that struck them in that instant as the worst thing I'd ever experienced, and they knew instantly that something was horribly wrong. Joyce was discovered lying on her back next to a shopping bag surrounded by Christmas presents she had wrapped but never delivered. Her remains were described as mostly skeletal, and were so badly decomposed that Joyce had to be identified via her dental records. Since there was no real way of determining the cause of death, the police were forced to rule that Joyce's death was by natural causes, and there was nothing to suggest any kind of foul play had occurred. Yet as one pathologist admitted, after almost two years spent rotting in her apartment, the prospect of murder couldn't be 100% ruled out. Naturally, the first person the police wanted to talk to concerning Joyce's death was the mysterious boyfriend of Winter, 2003. But given that no one knew this man's identity, there was no tracking him down. Police then attempted to track down Joyce's abusive ex, but he too seemed to have just dropped off the face of the earth. Joyce's sisters then hired a private detective to look for him and even begged the Salvation Army to help, but it seems for whatever reason... Joyce's ex did not want to be found. 
When asked why they neglected to check on her, one of Joyce's friends noted that she was someone who fled at signs of trouble, who walked out of jobs if she clashed with a colleague, and who moved from one flat to the next all over London. She didn't answer the phone to her sister and didn't appear to have her own circle of friends, instead relying on the company of relative strangers who came in the form of a new boyfriend, a colleague, or a flatmate. Maybe it was just them making excuses, or maybe Joyce really did want to be left alone. If that's the case, her self-isolation meant she lay alone and festering on the floor of a London apartment for almost three years. What if this abusive ex-boyfriend really had weaseled his way back into her life and she'd had the good sense to try and escape him again? If he knew how isolated she was, how no one would come to check on her, this might present someone with the perfect opportunity to kill without detection, or at least to kill, and then be able to get as far away as possible without anyone suspecting anything. Yet at this point in the story, it's hard to know which is more frightening. The callous maliciousness it would take to murder a woman simply for wanting to be free, or the cold indifference of the people around her who didn't think to check on her until it was far, far too late. For many of us, one of the only silver linings to a dark and frigid winter is the possibility of snowfall. Nothing makes holidays feel quite as festive as waking up Christmas morning and looking out of a window to see a blanket of fluffy, freshly fallen snow. As time, technology, and abundance have advanced in unison, snow has become something we hold a great deal of affection for, associating it with the wholesome fun of snowball fights, while 50s crooners implore the clouds above to let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. We're quick to forget that, as time goes by, the sight of snowflakes falling from the sky was something humanity had learned to dread. Not just because snowfall promised biting cold and a dearth of sustenance, but because it could fall in apocalyptic amounts. In the winter of early 1972, the people of northwestern Iran were suffering terribly. It had proven to be one of the coldest winters in modern history, with supplies of food and medicine dwindling as temperatures plummeted to negative 13 degrees Fahrenheit which is a whopping minus 25 degrees Celsius. What's worse, a flu epidemic had been ravaging the more isolated and less prepared rural areas, making relief efforts even more difficult. Then, right when it seemed like things couldn't get any worse, a series of snowstorm clouds began to gather over the Azerbaijani border, as if preparing for a full-scale meteorological invasion. This invasion commenced in earnest on February 3rd, with blizzards dumping a terrifying 7.9 meters of snow onto some rural regions. For scale, 7.9 meters is about the size of a two and a half story building. This gargantuan level of snow destroyed entire trees, took down power lines, and completely buried thousands of railroads, roads, and villages. Even some heavy duty vehicles were crushed by the weight of the snowfalls, which effectively buried entire regions completely isolating them from any potential aid. The situation remained that way for an entire week, with some officials estimating that the entirety of western Iran was completely covered in an 8-meter blanket of snow. Finally, on February 9th, there came a 24-hour lull in the blizzards, and a rescue operation was immediately launched. Numerous helicopter-mounted search and rescue teams flew out to a number of afflicted villages, but when they arrived, what they found shook them to their cores. Entire villages, most of which were made up of single-story homes, were completely buried under the mammoth snowdrifts. In some villages, such as southern central villages of Kakan and Kumar, there was not a single survivor. Literally hundreds of people were buried in their homes before being either suffocated or frozen by the sheer magnitudes of the blizzards. In one village, Rescue workers managed to recover 18 dead bodies, most of which were from the same family. Yet when the blizzards recommenced on February 11th, they were forced to abandon their efforts and surrender any progress that they had made to the snows. 
In another village, a place called Sheklob, Iranian army helicopters left behind a heap of provisions on the snowdrifts surrounding the village in the hopes that the survivors might be able to recover the food after digging their way out of their frozen grave. The helicopters returned a few days later, only to find the food completely untouched. It was later discovered that every single one of Sheklob's 100 residents had perished during the blizzard. By the time spring broke in the mountains of Iran, the government estimated that just over 4,000 people had lost their lives as a result of the snowstorms, making the Iranian blizzards of 1972 the deadliest in recorded history. So, this year, if heavy snowfalls make life a little inconvenient, or if you're forced to de-ice that windshield early in the morning, remember that you could be so much worse. And instead of a few inches or a few feet, Mother Nature has the capacity to bury you and everyone you know in little over 24 hours. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, brain burritos give you brain farts. <laughs>